So here we are. We're going to start a new series, as I mentioned, uh, working through Matthew uh, chapter 5, um, all the way through to chapter 8 over the course of the year, looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is uh, considered not just within kind of religious Christian circles, but actually even within the secular circles, one of the most significant speeches in the history of the world. You know, uh, apparently Martin Luther King with uh, I've Got a Dream is up there. Um, but apparently this one is too, um, in terms of uh, particular parts that people know and that have deeply uh, shaped uh, particularly Western society in many respects. Uh, and so it's wonderful that we can kind of step into it, um, given that it is not only so profound, but something that particularly if we've been part of church for a while is actually quite familiar. Because my hope is that um, as we engage with these profound teachings of Jesus, um, that it stirs up something new within you. Um, and you discover that there are layers to this teaching that perhaps you didn't see or perhaps you haven't heard before. Um, and the same is definitely true with what we're going to be looking at tonight, which is the Beatitudes. Again, a very famous part of Scripture, the blessed are uh, passage. And, uh, and so we're going to look at this uh, in a little bit of depth. But before I, I do, I, I want us to consider this idea of the new year. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not a huge fan of New Year's resolutions, but I do know that for some, it's actually a really important part uh, of their life. There's a sense in which I was chatting about this with Anita just this morning, you know, in some respects, every new day is a new opportunity. You know, what makes this particular kind of documented day of the year, the new year, so significant for people? And and I was kind of saying and sharing that I, that I think in as much as perhaps we don't kind of... In, ingratiate ourselves within kind of the, the kind of rhythms and the traditions so much, uh, I, I think there's something quite profound about having particular dates where you are forced to reassess and reflect. And I think that's kind of what it does, whether they be events like birthdays or New Year's or particular special days. It's like they force us to stop. And even if we choose not to stop, we know we're not stopping, right? Because everyone else is doing something different. And so I hope that we can do the same with uh, this reflection in the new year. And so when it comes to New Year's resolutions, like I said, I don't do a whole lot. But I know that for many people, it's actually a very big deal. But they always seem to be lists of things that you want to do more of. Now, given some people are like, I need to rest more. Okay, So there's a sense in which it's like sometimes it means stopping certain things, and that's fine too. But usually we frame them as it's going to be an effort to prevent the momentum of my life that is currently heading in this direction, and I'm going to place a little marker in the ground and say things are going to be different, right? News resolutions don't just happen, they are a discipline, right? And when it comes to a discipline, it almost, for many of us, can be like a checklist. Did I do this today or did I not do this today? And this idea of constantly needing to work harder so that we don't slide into old rhythms can also sneak its way into our faith expression as well. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a good thing to grow in our faith. Jesus wants us to become more and more Christ-like and, and the pursuit of God will hopefully, eventually, kind of in the midst of the ups and downs of life and the various things that we learn, hopefully will become more Christ-like. But, but like I said, sometimes what can happen is even in our pursuit of God, our faith actually becomes kind of a list of rules to follow, a things to kind of aspire toward and to achieve. And, and I think that's the risk of this passage in the Beatitudes. And I want us to be very, very careful with what we're encountering tonight in this text because so easily it can become a picture of something that we're not actually supposed to strive for, but rather it is a grand invitation of Jesus. And these are two very different things. To give some context, and if you've got your Bible, feel free to turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 5. You might have a different translation. God might want something to pop out and inspire you in some way. But just to provide a bit of context, it says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, and we'll be going through to verse 12 today. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, that's right, the verse ends with he said. And so this is the context. Jesus is seeing the crowds and he's got his disciples and he knows that there is a moment where he's going to have to deliver some, some pretty significant teaching on what makes his message unique. Now, for those of you who have been part of this church for a while, you may be familiar with this terminology, but a rabbi, which Jesus was in Jewish tradition, each rabbi would have what they called their yoke. Their yoke was their set of teachings, the things that they thought were important, their particular interpretations of scripture, right? 
So they had the Torah, they had the law, and they had to say, well, it's one thing to have the law, but now we need to interpret it, right? And the rabbis would each have their yoke, and their yoke was essentially the sum total of all their different interpretations. And different people would choose to follow different rabbis based upon their yoke. Rabbis didn't always agree. <laughs> Might surprise you. But this was the controversy, right? So this moment here with Jesus seeing the crowd and having his disciples, this was a profound moment for him to share his yoke with the people. Now, Jesus, this wasn't the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In fact, straight after the temptation, it declares what Jesus' primary ministry was from that point on. It says, from that moment on, Jesus declared this message wandering around. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This was Jesus' primary message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And repent means to shift your mind. It means literally in the Greek it means to have a mind change. You'll change your brain essentially. It's like you have been thinking this way about what it looks like to honour God. You've been living thinking this way about what it looks like to honour and love others. And I want you to shift your perspective in some way because what I'm going to deliver to you is something new. And he says, I want you to repent, I want you to think differently, because the kingdom of God, that is God's reality, the accessibility of God and his way is at hand, it is available to you. And this is a really, really big deal, particularly for those who may have felt like they were somehow excluded from the reality of God because of a list of religious rules. Perhaps they were excluded from the reality of God because of the certain characteristics that they had, certain experiences that they had. And yet Jesus' primary message was, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But it wasn't just his words. It was show and tell. And so in the showing, he also demonstrated that through miracles, through healing, through all these different ways. And so Jesus had already, up to this point in time, he'd engaged with the crowd a lot, right? He was not only declaring that the kingdom of God was at hand, he was demonstrating it through power. And so here we have the show, and now here's a little bit more of the tell. And this is where we get to these profound and quite common words. I'm just going to go through them quickly because we're going to revisit them a little bit later on. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, interchangeable, okay? Kingdom of heaven is what's written in Matthew. Kingdom of God is what's written in Luke. Both mean the same thing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this list of the Beatitudes, and I've heard it preached on a lot of times, often it is preached on as a list of this kind of picture of the perfect Christian. It's like almost like there's this checklist of characteristics. It's like these are the things that God desired because if God desires these things and you embody these things, then you will be blessed or blessed, right? This is often how it is presented. But what that ends up doing is precisely what the New Year's resolution risks doing, which is here are certain kind of characteristics and unless I tick them all off, therefore I am not doing right by God. I will not be blessed. There's this kind of inverse, right? Where it's like, well, if I'm blessed for having these qualities, if I don't have these qualities, then clearly I am not blessed. You can see how problematic this can become and how easily it just simply reflects the legalism that the crowds would have already been exposed to in their day, right? There's always the risk that we end up perpetuating legalism in the way that we share the teachings of Jesus when what Jesus was wanting to do is actually subvert what was already being experienced by the crowds at the time. You see, if we create a list of characteristics of the ideal Christian and seek to follow them, what we end up with is finding ourselves in two particular places. One, we don't tick off everything and we end up feeling guilty. I can't be all these things, right? Which, of course, is not what God wants. 
Or maybe we work really, really hard to kind of garner all those characteristics and then we say, look at me, I tick off all the things, I must be right by God, which is just arrogance, right? So we end up either guilty or arrogant, right, whenever we conform to a list that we simply need to tick off. And so when it comes to the Beatitudes, it's important to recognize that first and foremost, this is not an instructional teaching. That's the risk, right? That we turn this into an instructional teaching. This right here is an invitation. This is a grand invitation to the crowds and to the disciples, to the people who did not think that they would be in. Those people who thought the kingdom of God, for whatever reason, the way of God, the pursuit of God, the blessing of God, was somehow removed from them simply because they did not conform to particular characteristics that perhaps the Pharisees or other rabbis or whoever it was said that they should. I mean, even note from memory some of the characteristics that were talked about in this particular passage. You know, meekness, you know, mourning. These aren't the kind of characteristics that naturally convey victory. The people at the time were under the oppression of the Romans, right? And what was their methodology? It was all about being victorious and being powerful and, and success and power looked like the Romans. And yet what Jesus is saying Actually, I might also say, sometimes that was also interpreted as a blessing of the gods, right? Because, of course, if they're in power, God put them there. And yet Jesus comes in and subverts this understanding and says, what you see out there, you, that determination of success, I want to tell you something different. Actually, there's a different mark of success that you need to see. I love what Dallas Willard says in the book The Divine Conspiracy. He says, the Beatitudes in particular are not teachings on how to be blessed. They are not instructions to do anything. They do not indicate conditions that are especially pleasing to God or good for human beings. We'll unpack that in a little bit. They single out cases that provide proof that in him that is God, the rule of God from the heavens truly is available in life circumstances that are beyond all human hope. The Beatitudes are a grand invitation not a checklist of qualities that we need to pursue as a Christian. When I was down in Melbourne, uh, there's, uh, I was staying, we were staying with our in-laws and um, John and Judy, and uh, there's been a, something written on their fridge for years. It goes back like so long. Like, I kind of feel like, I don't know how long it's been there, but I've noticed it every single time I go there. It might have even been there back when Megs and I were dating. It's been there so long. On their fridge, <coughs> and, and it always catches my attention, and and I knew actually even coming to visit that this Beatitudes message was in the back of my mind. I knew that I would see it again. And I was going to ask Judy what it was about. And it was this little note. Now, they're, on their fridge, they've got notes scattered all over their fridge. Like, you cannot see a white spot that is not covered in paper. But it was this little note here. And it said, blessed, note the little dot in the middle, blessed equals close to the heart of God. And I, and I said to, to Judy, uh, my mother-in-law, I said to her, I said, tell me, who taught you? Who, who, prompted that. Why is that on the fridge? Why has it stayed there for so long? And she said, Anne Prime actually mentioned it, um, which was uh, a pastor or a friend at, at, at the church. And, uh, and she said, I just need to write it down. And, and, uh, and I kind of probed a little bit more, and I just really love this definition. Because rather than this idea of being blessed is like the consequence of like pursuit and having these qualities, like this kind of tick box thing, it's when you are blessed, you are close to the heart of God. And now there's two different ways we can interpret that. One, we could say, well, when I do these things, that God approves of them. But the other thing is, particularly when it comes to the Beatitudes, it's like when you are experiencing these characteristics, when you are mourning, when you are meek, when you are being persecuted, you are actually close to God's heart. He, he, he actually sees you. He knows you. He embraces you in that moment. And I really love that. It's like you are closer to God than you realize. That's what it means to be blessed. You are close to the heart of God. And that's what Jesus was saying as he shared this invitation to the crowd. It's like, you may carry one or more of these characteristics. I'm just spitballing a couple of things, right, that you may resonate with. But I want you to know that if you resonate with this characteristic, you are close to the heart of God. And that is good news for the crowd. And that is good news for us here in Alice Springs as we consider the kind of people that the message of Jesus is truly a good news for. 
the oppressed, the abandoned crowd that Jesus was speaking to were looking for hope, just as people are looking for hope today. And so I want to just work through these Beatitudes and just quickly touch on each one. And I want you to try as best you can to see whether or not it resonates with you or someone else, someone in your world. It may be that you're like, I've experienced that. Then listen for Jesus' response. It may be that someone in your world you know is experiencing that. That's good news for them too. Because this was a grand invitation. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you need a a really clear example of like, why this is an invitation, not instruction. To be poor in spirit is actually not a good thing. We've actually seen this translated in a number of translations very, very badly. Sometimes they try to change this to humble in spirit and they try to twist it into some sort of positive characteristic because they're trying to turn it into a list. They're trying to go, I've got to make all these work, right? In the Greek, it means empty, poor. It's bad, (laughs) poor in spirit. We're talking about people who who religion has done a number on them, and they are just spiritually dry. That's the kind of words we use nowadays. It's like, oh, just really dry in my spirit right now. It's like they have been burnt by religion. They are poor in spirit. There is a lack. They are destitute in terms of what it means to spiritually attain something or the kind of quality of life. And and, and you may have experienced that or, or maybe know someone who's experienced it. Jesus is saying, hey, if that is you, If you are feeling right now poor in spirit, like, I just can't do the God thing, well, guess what? The kingdom is available to you. (laughs) Like, they're the person, like, as in, when you're spiritually destitute, you're poor in spirit, you're like, God isn't interested in this, (laughs) right? That's the kind of thing that will want make you exclude yourself. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. If you resonate with being poor in spirit, don't worry, don't worry. Kingdom of God is for you. I don't know about you, that's a good news for a whole bunch of people in my world who either religion has done a number on them or it's just never been in their world. They would call it spirituality, right? They're not spiritual. They can't get a handle on it. It doesn't work for them. Well, guess what? The way of Jesus is good news to them. Blessed are those who mourn. Again, Jesus is like, hey, I just got to really up my mourning. Like, gee, I'm not mourning enough to be the perfect Christian. I've got to mourn all the time. No, like, come on. That's not what is going on here. Jesus is saying, you, you're here in the crowd. Do you know the experience of what it means to mourn? Maybe it is because you've been suffering under oppression, like the guys were suffering under the Romans. Or, or, or maybe it is that you've, you've lost someone in your family and you feel like they're going down a really difficult path. I was talking to someone this morning who was feeling that, and they were mourning and we were praying after the service for this, for this man and, and his son, who, he, was, he was genuinely in mourning because he felt like his son was drifting away and about to make some unwise choices. A- and there was just this reminder of going, for you, right, you, sir, right there, maybe you feel like in this moment God has abandoned you. Right? But I want you to know that the kingdom of God is available to you. It's good news for you. You will be comforted. What about the meek? Some people just aren't meek. I mean, look at me. I'm like standing up on a platform. I mean, sometimes I'd like to be meek. I'd like to hide away. But but there's a sense of like, you know, some people just like, if if meekness is not a characteristic that you have, you're all kind of, you know, you're out there and and you're putting yourself out there and God has given you that, then imagine if you try to turn this into a list of the ideal Christian, like, just got to get more meek. Like, it just doesn't work. But there are people who Jesus was speaking to who no doubt were the The opposite to the Romans, they were the quiet ones, the unassertive, the intimidated. Well, the kingdom, Jesus says, is available to you. You don't need to stand up on that platform. You don't need to make a big deal out of yourself. The kingdom of God is available to you. I love how he twists it. It's like the meek, the ones who feel like they are the most distanced, the most kind of like, I don't have anything to contribute, I'm intimidated. They will inherit the earth. Like Jesus flips this over and says, what you think you are not capable of experiencing, you will experience in a profound way because that is God's invitation to you. Oh, sorry, I keep jumping forward. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So here's where we start getting to the list where people start going, oh, yeah, that's a good Christian quality. And good, hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is not a bad thing. But remember that a hunger and thirst for righteousness can also be this burning desire for things to be made right right. And you know when you have a burning desire for things to be made right, this can be a very oppressive state. 
If you don't experience it, that, that's fine. That could be for somebody else, right? But if you resonate with this, you know this. When you have a desire for things to be made right, you are your worst self-critic. <laughs> and that is a difficult place to be when it comes to encountering a God who is perfect. It's like, it's like I don't deserve, right? Because my hunger and thirst for righteousness actually discounts me from being available to God. And yet Jesus says, if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness and you are your worst critic, or maybe maybe you get angry at the world because it's not as perfect as you want it to be, don't worry. The kingdom of God is available to you. And you will be filled. You will receive what you desire. Not from your own efforts, of course, but from God. Blessed are the merciful. Now, the merciful is an interesting one, right? Because again, mercy is, is a beautiful characteristic and it's a lovely one. But the merciful are also people who are often exploited. Right? It's like, I choose to demonstrate mercy and I get taken advantage of. I hate to say it, but that is often the way of the world, right? We extend forgiveness and maybe we get hurt again. We extend mercy and we get exploited. I have no doubt there would have been people in the crowd who would have been doing their best to extend mercy and trying to demonstrate faithfulness to Yahweh at the time, and they would have been exploited. And so Jesus is saying, if you're out there and you are someone who has been uh, extending mercy, the kingdom of God is available for you because there is a justice that God can offer to you, a justice that you need. Pure in heart much similar to uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, again, whom nothing is good enough. It's like, it, it always kind of comes back to this sense of like, like, again, pure in heart. It sounds like a positive characteristic, but it has these really rough edges where when we take it to the nth degree, nothing stacks up. You know, these, uh, sorry, pure in heart, the perfectionists, um, nothing ever stacks up, should I say. And sometimes this can mean that they're a pain to everyone and to themselves most of all. And when it comes to religion, of course, these people find errors in the doctrine and probably heart and attitude and practice, you know, and they'll be even harder on themselves. And yet, Jesus says, you will see God. You will see God. The invitation is for you. Blessed are the peacemakers. Surely peacemakers is a good thing. Why would the peacemakers need this invitation? Why? Because being a peacemaker is hard if you're a peacemaker. Do you know why? Because you're always in the middle of two people who are fighting. And that's where you get shot. <laughs> being a peacemaker means that both people don't like you <laughs> to a certain degree. It's not an easy place to be. And Jesus is saying, hey, some of you guys in the crowd and some of you here today and some of the people in your world are peacemakers. And Jesus says, hey, I've got a good news for you they will be called children of God. No matter what those people on either side of you call you, you will be called children of God. And so listen up, because this is a good news message for you. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We have people who are attacked for doing what is right. These are the, the classic whistleblowers, right? The whistleblowers who have been hurt and burdened and unfairly treated, and sometimes these people carry wounds not just for the moment but for life. Are there any whistleblowers who have chosen to do the right thing at great cost? Well, Jesus says this invitation is for you. It's not like, man, I'm not being persecuted enough. I better go out there and get more persecuted so that I can be blessed. Again, this is not what Jesus is getting on about. He's saying, if you find yourself in that place, this message of the kingdom of God is going to be good news for you. And lastly, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say kinds, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Again, some people may have experienced this, and many people would, certainly following Jesus. I mean, even the religious leaders of the day thought that they were doing a good thing for God when they killed him. Let's not forget that. There's a sense in which it's like this is potentially a reality of our life. We don't go hunting for people to insult us. We don't go hunting for persecution. We don't have to go hunting for people to say false lies about us. But if they do because of Jesus, then don't worry. Jesus is for you. Jesus would later use a parable of a wedding banquet 
to essentially illustrate what he's doing here in this Beatitudes. He would talk about the fact that there was a, a story of a man who sent out invitations for his wedding and he went to particular people. And certain people were invited, but they made excuses not to come. And so instead, the man sent the word out and extended the invitation to everybody. And everybody was welcome to the banquet. This is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, you are welcome. If you are experiencing these things, this message that I'm about to share is good news for you. You see, if we are really walking in the good news of the kingdom, I think one of the best examples of this is that we can go with confidence to any hopeless people around us and convey the assurance that they are able to enter a blessed life with God. <laughs> it's like Jesus extends this invitation so that we know we can extend this invitation too. And so I ask again, do any of these situations, not qualities, <laughs> situations emerge from your story right now? Do any of these words, these things that Jesus identified, do they resonate with you? Because you need to be know today that Jesus' way is good news for you if you find yourself there. And secondly, are any of these situations reflected in the people around you? And I feel like this is kind of the rub for me as well. I think about the people around me, I think of those who are mourning, those who are meek, or those who for whatever reason feel like they may be excluded. The good news is that Jesus' way is good news for them too. So my hope is that before any other New Year's resolutions, <laughs> that we resolve before anything else to know that we are already loved by the creator of the universe. We don't need this checklist of things in order to be loved, in order to be accepted, in order to access the kingdom of God. It is at hand. Now, Jesus invites us to think differently, and maybe that's the different thinking that we need to do, to not conform to these kind of lists of legal expectation where we think we're going to be blessed if we tick these characteristics, but rather simply receive the invitation, the beautiful invitation. And I hope that as a church this year, we can be a church that both receives and reflects this kind of invitation. God says, trust in who I am. Trust that I have done enough. You already can find rest. Jesus would later describe this as his yoke being light. And we're going to be reminded of this regularly through this Sermon on the Mount series, where we might be tempted to conform to some kind of legalism. Jesus says, my yoke, my teachings are light. And that's what we must remember. So uh, I'm just going to pray before we sing a final song. But I hope that something of the Beatitudes has resonated with you or someone that you know. So that you know that Jesus' news and Jesus' way is good news for them. Let me pray. Now, Jesus, we're just so grateful, God, that you extend the invitation to us. And it's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking that, that we need to kind of earn um, our access to you. And God, that's never been the way. It's all about what you have done. And I think about that crowd and I think about those disciples and perhaps how they were raised and all the rules that they had to try and keep um, and at the risk of feeling like they were somehow exposed and removed. And God, while you want to do a work in us, we know that first and foremost, it's actually about receiving that invitation and trusting you. When we trust you, we open ourselves up for you to do the transforming work in our life rather than us striving. And so, God, I want to pray that if there are people here tonight or joining us online or people in our world who are, who are feeling that hopelessness, that oppression because they have experienced any of these characteristics or even ones that Jesus doesn't identify, I just want to pray, God, that we would know that Jesus' way is good news for them that you would give us an opportunity to share something that is hopeful and life-giving with them, to help connect them with a God who already loves them and who is for them. God, may our faith, God, yeah, be so much more than some sort of checklist, but rather a pursuit of the rest that is found in you, knowing that you have done enough. And so thank you, God, that you can be holy. 
so that we don't have to be. So that we can trust in your saving grace and seek to follow you and reflect you as best we can. Knowing we won't always get it right, but that you've already done enough. In Jesus' name, amen.